this is a, a bittersweet evening. Yeah. Again. Uh, my friend John, your friend John, executive vice president of our Concord Historical Society, and a thousand other things. Of course, I'm talking about John Fair. Can you hear in the back okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, there's not much that John didn't do to contribute to our community. And I was very honored in the past two or three years to be even closer with him as he became our executive director and I could work with him on planning Second Thursday program, which he planned this evening, tonight, three months ago, before the proverbial hit the fan, I might say. But, uh, so, before we get started, I'd like to take a, a moment for all of us to remember John. Please. Thank you. For those of you who haven't seen what's in the paper and funeral arrangements, they are. Here those of you, they're next Sunday at 1 o'clock at St. Andrew's Church in Hopkinton. And uh, also in that article in the paper, it mentioned that there's a gathering at the Snowshoe Club at 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon after the funeral, uh, a memorial service. Uh, I can tell you that the family is holding up, but I'm leaving them alone. They are in great sorrow. And this was just a very stunning, devastating thing to have happen. And I can tell you as recently as a week ago, John and I were on the phone and he said he was going to be here with us tonight. That's how that happens. So, thank you all for being here and for taking a minute. Oh, I'm Jim Milliken, by the way. I'm chair of the Concord Historical Society. And a uh, little bit of homework before we get started. Uh, books. We have our history book over here for twenty dollars, and it's normally a forty-dollar thing. But for these events, we reduce it. I can't encourage you enough. I didn't look up Artie, but he's probably in the book. I bet you are. Uh, so take advantage of that if you if you'd like. Also, something very interesting. We just found twenty dollars on the floor. Right? <laughs> so I'll raise your hands. <laughs> if you truly lost the twenty dollars, I literally have it. <laughs> um, when we put these together, John uh, really does the most of the detail, but we always have help from others, and I can't say enough about Kimball Jenkins' estate and what uh, what they've done for us in the past and when I came here tonight, all set up. And that's the way we had a, the glory to objective operate. And this is a great place for you to watch the things going on come here. And uh, also the Walker Lectures uh, have always supported the second Thursday program uh, that has a lot to do with our success. And you know, I said John would be right over there filming right now. But instead, I called Conquer TV, and guess what? Oh. Josh Hardy, the executive director, and and uh, is it Becky? Did I say or Lily? Chelsea. Chelsea. Chelsea, I'm sorry. A good friend of his. It's helping. Uh, 
our next Second Thursday program uh, for August, we, we were going to take a break on that, and that's still the plan. So there won't be one next month. We had, we had planned not to have one long ago. Again, John has contributed to all of this planning. But we'll be back in September, and uh, we'll look forward to you all coming again. This is uh, our goal to continue these year-round, except perhaps like in August. We think that this has been an important contribution on our part to the community to follow up on historical things. And why are we here tonight? Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. You know, there, there are a lot of people in our community who you've never even heard of, probably, who have been making contributions to the betterment of our lives and our community for years. And uh, a lot of people to be proud of, and a lot of unspoken heroes. Um, you may some, know some. If you do, by the way, would you let me know somebody in particular <laughs> that's important to you? Uh, because we'll follow up. We'll, the Pompey Historical Society is committed to history and the facts. And tonight's presentation to lead into that. Uh, clearly, it, it, uh, Elizabeth has gotten enough publicity so that we all now know, well, we know who that person is. <laughs> and that's a good thing, because there's a lot. How many people went to Gibson's bookstore last night and heard a presentation on a young lady? What was, her name was Converse, right? Connie Converse. Connie Converse. Ooh, in the world is Connie Gibson has an author there who's written a book about her. She's a, she was a musician, an artist, folk person from Concord. Born in Laconia, graduated from Concord High School. That's the kind of stuff that's important. And I, we're committed to continuing to do that. And we love having you here on our second Thursdays. And you continue to see us do that. Question? Yes, sir. Yeah, do you think that Elizabeth Gurley Brown took her name from from this Elizabeth Gurley? That's a great question. I know where the answer is. About two minutes. <laughs> Audie, do you know something? I'm pretty sure, but we'll get to, we can get to that later, hopefully, yeah. if we get time for questions and discussion. Some people here don't know her, believe it or not. <laughs> So, if you give me one minute, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because it's fascinating. It's fascinating like when you read the things about John in the newspaper. Things that... Well, Arnie is a longtime activist and organizer in movements for peace and social economic justice. After serving on the staff of the Clamshell Alliance, from 1978 to 1979. He served as the co-director or director of the American Friends Service Committee, New Hampshire's program, from 1981 until 2020. In that position, he played a leadership role in the campaigns to establish a state holiday named for Martin Luther King Jr. and to repeal the state's death penalty. Over the years, he's trained hundreds or perhaps thousands of people in nonviolent techniques, including conflict de-escalation, bird dogging presidential candidates and civil disobedience, wrote numerous articles for New Hampshire newspapers and other publications, and hosted a weekly radio program on WNHN-LP for eight years. Over the years, Arnie won awards from groups, including the Manchester NAACP, the Martin Luther King Coalition, the New Hampshire AFL-CIO, the New Hampshire Women's Lobby, the ACLU of New Hampshire, Revere University, and King State College. Now he's, re he's retired, believe it or not. Since retirement in 2020, he's written a column active with the activists for in-depth New Hampshire organization, 
uh, winning second place in the New Hampshire Press Association columnist of the year category in 2023. And by the way, in-depth New Hampshire.org, that's online. Uh, you may want to follow that. Uh, Arnie also created a website, New Hampshire Radical History.org, which has about 30 stories about people, organizations, and movements that have stirred things up in the Granite State. He is capable of that. <laughs> in 2021, with his friend Mary Lee Sargent, Arnie initiated a project to have the state install a historical marker near the birthplace of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in Concord. Arnie is a member of the National Writers Union. He lives in Canada. Help me welcome Arnie. <laughs> Oh, and just as I was driving in today, I was thinking a little bit about listening to the news and thinking about what's in the news right now. You get stories about unions going on strike, stories about reproductive rights and contraception, stories about free speech and protest, stories about racism and civil rights, stories about immigrants and immigrants' rights. This is what's in the news all around us, and all of these topics uh, are related to the life and example of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and just help us think about why, why history matters. A um, little piece of my own history here that's relevant for what Jim was just saying about John Graffair. John was actually among the founders of the New Hampshire program of the American Friends Service Committee in 1975 and served as the clerk of what was called the support committee, kind of like the advisory board for the program for a number of years, including in the year in which I was hired and John served on the search committee that offered me the position. So I'm very grateful to John for that. And in the years that followed as John developed his uh, documentary production and public affairs programming. Um, I was able to uh, work with him on arranging for guests and various programs and such over the, over the years. So I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to John and I'm very sad about his death. And um, I'm glad to see so many people here tonight because it's also sort of some evidence of the work that he did that it matters, uh, that what goes on in our community matters and that all of us have a part have a part that we, we can play. Um, it was back in March, I mean, I had talked to John about this Elizabeth Gurley Flynn historical marker project some time ago, and uh, he knew that, you know, that the marker had been approved, uh, and he approached me in March and said, uh, hey, how about you come and speak to the Historical Society in July? Because a lot of people, the marker will be up by then, and there will be, you know, there will be people who would like to learn more about this woman who's on the marker. And I just, I said, of course, you know, and I just assumed that I'd be sitting around a table with like 10 or 15 people, um, his, you know, local history enthusiasts, and I'd share a little bit of what I knew, and they'd share what they knew, and we'd have a conversation about stuff, and that that would be nice. And then, as uh, Jim said, uh, the, after the marker went up, the stuff hit the fan, and now a whole lot more people are interested in the story of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And um, I don't know how many people you usually get, but uh, I'm, this looks, looks good to me to see you, see you all here. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk more about the marker at the, at the end. I really want to talk about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who is about to turn 133 in August. Um, the, but the state's historical marker policy says that the, the, about the subject of markers, they say the person, place, event, organization, or innovation to be marked had a significant impact on its times and has demonstrated historical significance. So we ask, what demonstrates historical significance? How do we know? that a person, a place, an event, an organization is historically significant. So one, one thing we might say is, well, if a person repeatedly shows up in the New York Times, that might be something of an indication. So let's start there. Uh, this article about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's first arrest appeared in the Times on, I think it was August 23rd, 1906, when she was 16 years old. She had already been written up in papers in New York and in Philadelphia for other things that she had done. She was already making a name for herself as a public speaker. So 
she, but she was hitting the big time in a sense. If we think about the New York Times even back then as the big time, she was already there at the age of 16. But let's go back to the beginning. Annie Gurley and Thomas Flynn were married in Concord, New Hampshire on November 27, 1889, here in Concord. They lived at 12 Montgomery Street. Now, Montgomery Street back then went all the way from North State through to North Main. And number 12, where they lived, is sort of right, um, right over here. Uh, and that's basically where the Concord Housing Authority uh, house is and where, uh, where Bob's son David lives now. In the Elizabeth, oh, there you are, all right, good, excellent. So this is uh, someone who lives on top of where Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was born uh, in, at that time. Now, Annie Gurley, note that she kept her name Gurley after she got married. Um, she was born in Galway, Ireland in 1859, the oldest girl of 13 children. They immigrated to Boston in 1887. Uh, they moved to Concord, where she worked as a seamstress and cared for several younger brothers and sisters. Annie and her brothers were all members of the Knights of Labor which organized unskilled workers, men and women, immigrants, and native-born. She was interested in ideas. She was a voracious reader. She encouraged her daughter to do the same, but she went to lectures at White's Opera House with people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass when they came to town. She was a member of the Edward Bellamy Club of Concord. Who knew there was an Edward Bellamy Club in Concord? But there apparently was at that time. Um, she was always a feminist. She supported suffrage. She kept her name after marriage. And she insisted on having women doctors. And she instructed her daughters and son not to use racial or ethnic epithets. And she really was the rock of the family. She was married to Thomas, who wasn't the rock of the family. Um, <laughs> Tom Flynn's father immigrated to Canada from Ireland and then to Maine, where Thomas was probably born. He started working in the quarries as a child and continued doing quarry work in Concord. He was proudly descended from generations of Irish rebels against British imperial rule. And uh, Elizabeth said in her memoir that whenever England brought, was brought up in conversation, he would say, England, goddamn her. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Tom's father died in 1877 and is buried in Pennacook. I don't know anything about Tom's mother. Um, Tom Flynn briefly attended Dartmouth College to study engineering. And there's an interesting story there that he was one of a number of Irish students at Dartmouth. And because the college required everybody to attend Protestant religious services, Tom and his buddies didn't want to do that. So they didn't go. And Tom got summoned into the dean's office and chastised for this and was told or, to name the names of his other people who weren't going to services. And Tom refused to name names, for which he was expelled briefly from Dartmouth. Uh, he was, was, so just think about that, you know, in terms of things that followed in the, in the century afterward. Um, he actually he went back to school, but he had to leave when his brother died, and Tom was needed back in Concord to work and support the family. And from that point on, he worked as an engineer at one of the quarries. And I would love if there, you know, during discussion or afterward, if there are people here who know about the quarries during the late 1800s uh, and what was going on during that period of time. I would also love to know if there's anybody here who's familiar with what the Irish community in Concord was like during this period of time, because that was where the, the Gurley and Flynn families were embedded in that world. So that would help me to understand the, the world that Elizabeth was born into at that time. In 1895, Tom Flynn took a job working for the city railway company in Manchester. The family moved down there. He ran for city engineer and lost. He believed it was because he was Irish. Uh, and then from there, uh, they left the state. They moved to Cleveland, then they moved to Adams, Massachusetts, and, uh, which Elizabeth noted was the birthplace of Susan B. Anthony. Uh, and then they moved to the Bronx. Uh, Tom was active in the anti-imperialist movement at the time of the Spanish-American War. And 
the family, after they moved to the Bronx, that's where they started learning about socialism. Uh, and they learned it from Germ German Americans and also from Yiddish speaking uh, Jewish Americans who lived in Manhattan. Now, Elizabeth was born on August 7th, 1890. I understand that she was called Lizzie, and I've seen some reference to her being called Bessie. But by uh, later on, uh, I don't think anybody used those terms for her. She was delivered and named for Dr. Elizabeth Kent, who was a doctor here in Concord. And again, one of the, my history questions is, was she a descendant of uh, George Kent and the abolitionist Kents who were active in Concord in the 1840s or so? So if somebody can fill me in on that later on, I would be, I would be grateful. Uh, she was an A student when she went to school. Um, by age 12, she wrote an essay about a coal miner strike that was going on. At age 14, she won a medal for the New York Times for an essay on why women should have the right to vote. In high school, she was encouraged to join the debate club, which she did. And she wrote later, I remember arguing that women, oh yeah, she, in the debate club, she wrote why women should have the right to vote. And she argued for the government to own the coal mines. Her dad, dragged her to socialist meetings, and I don't know that he had to drag very hard because she went, and you know be, that's where her road to socialism began, although she actually had an anarchist boyfriend for a while, um, and he introduced, had her, introduced her to Emma Goldman. Um, I think she wasn't that impressed with Emma Goldman initially, although Emma was later impressed with her, uh, but they certainly knew each other. Um, her real education, though about labor, about women, about poverty, about capitalism, came from her experience in New England's mill towns, living in Manchester and living in Adams, Massachusetts. She describes in her uh, memoir, which I've got a copy of over here, she talks about moving from the clean city of Concord to three years in Manchester, which she described as a drab textile center. And she said, the gray mills in Manchester stretched like prisons along the banks of the Merrimack. 50% of the workers were women, and they earned $1 a day. Many lived in the antiquated corporation boarding houses, relics of the time when the mills were built. Our neighbors, men and women, rushed to the mills before the sun rose on cold winter days and returned after dark. They were poorly dressed and poverty stricken. The women wore no hats but shawls over their heads. The mill children left school early to take dinner pails to their parents. The mothers took times off in the mills to nurse their babies who were cared for by elderly relatives. I saw mill children eating bread with lard instead of butter. Many children were without underwear, even in the coldest weather. A young woman mill worker showing her hand where three fingers gone due to a mill accident shocked me immeasurably. Safety devices were unheard of. Now these impressions were reinforced when the family moved to Adams, Massachusetts, another mill town. And she write, wrote, once while we were in school in Adams, piercing screams came from the mill across the street. A girl's long hair had been caught in the unguarded machine and she was literally scalped. She also wrote that in Adams, the old mill owner lived in a great mansion in the center of town, drove around in a fine carriage with beautiful horses, and was once visited by President McKinley. Now, as Elizabeth's ideology, the parents' ideology really shifted from Irish nationalism and the ideals of the Knights of Labor to socialism, she went right along with them and became what she later called herself a mortal enemy of capitalism which she was for the rest of her life. She was a voracious reader based on her mother's example and encouragement. In her teenage years, she studied Thomas Paine, Karl Marx, Mary Wollstonecraft, and August Babel, Kropotkin. She read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle when it came out. She read utopian novels by Edward Bellamy. She also read William Morris. Um, she liked Bellamy better. I like Morris better. I would love to have a conversation with her about that, but that's for another, another time. She read Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, and she studied the US Constitution. Her biographer, Lyra Vopnik, says that her own approach to socialism was always tied to her understanding of the oppression of women, including their lack of control over their own bodies. At the age of 15, she gave her first public speech at the Harlem Socialist Club on the topic, what socialism will do for women. This got 
launched her career as a public speaker. It did get attention, in, at least in the socialist press of the time. And then she started getting invitations to speak at other socialist groups and labor events and started getting some attention in uh, New York, in New Jersey, and down in Philadelphia. She brought in the crowds. A Philadelphia reporter wrote, she had an odd manner of making what might be called shorthand gestures, pothooks, curves, dots, and dashes written in the air. Soon the crowd around her were frowning when she frowned, laughing when she laughed, growing terribly earnest when she grew moderately so. <laughs> On August 22nd, 1906, the New York Times reported on an incident which took place in the theater district of Manhattan, where the display of a red flag by people holding an open air socialist meeting excited the indignation of men in evening dress who were coming out of the theater. And one of them summoned a police officer to insist that the demonstration's leaders be arrested, and the police officer complied. It's amazing how little it can take to arouse indignation. <laughs> Elizabeth, her father, and a few others were carted off to jail. Now, this event was covered by five newspapers in addition to the Times. Apparently, they had slightly different views on what had happened, whether it was that the American flag was below the red flag or just that there was a red flag. And uh, anyway, but in any case, uh, she was, they spent the night in jail. They were bailed out at 2 AM. The judge told her to go back to school. The school expelled her, giving her more time to read and to think and to agitate. And she never went back to school, but her education obviously continued for the rest of her life. Uh, a few days later, there was an article in the New York Times about this incident in which she was referred to as a ferocious socialist haranguer. And it said, she tells us all what to think, which is just what she thinks. She was mentioned again in the Times a little while later after she gave a talk on education. There was one letter to the editor that was critical of her and one that supported her. So she was making news. At the age of 17, she joined the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW known commonly as the Wobblies. And she helped organize a strike in Bridgeport, Connecticut. She was later elected as a representative from the New York local of the IWW to the National Convention in Chicago. So at age 17, she took off by herself on a train to Chicago to go to the IWW convention. So let's talk a little bit about the IWW. It was formed in 1905. It believed in industrial unionism, not craft unionism, as opposed to the ideology and practice of the American Federation of Labor at that time. Uh, Wobbly sometimes joked that it was the American separation of labor, as opposed to the Federation of Labor. They, be they organized, believed in organizing all workers, regardless of sex, regardless of race, regardless of nationality, and regardless of language. Um, and if you think about it, many workers were immigrants. They had no rights to vote even for the men during this period of time. So their rights as workers in the workplace meant everything to them. They were syndicalists, which means that they believed in that the power of workers was won through their action in the workplace, not through political action. So again, these people mostly couldn't vote. They were women and immigrants. So voting and mainstream politics and parties meant little to them, although some of them, like Jean Debs, who was among the founder of the IWW, were members of the Socialist Party during this period of time. They were against capitalism. This is the preamble of the IWW, which still exists, and it still is their preamble. And it begins, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things of life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony with the earth. What they wanted was one big union. They believed that an injury to one is an injury to all. And they thought that they were ultimately going to achieve their power through strikes and a big general strike that was going to turn power from the capitalists to the workers. They organized in textile mills in the Northeast, in the mines of the Mesabi Range in the Rockies, in lumber camps in the Northwest, dock workers on both coasts, farm workers in the central states, cigar makers, hotel workers, and restaurant workers in New York City. <laughs> 
and they believed in singing. They were a singing union. And I brought a copy with me of uh, one of the more recent editions of the Little Red Songbook, which the Wobblies carried around in their pocket so that if they were on the picket line or somewhere else, they could break out into song. They were practitioners of free speech and defenders of free speech. And if you think about it, again, these were people who spoke many, many, many different languages. English was their second language, or perhaps their third or their fourth or their fifth. So to communicate with each other, they needed to t talk. Um, and they weren't, I mean, it wasn't like you know, passing out leaflets or treatises about theory. It wasn't how they were communicating with each other. And also, they were in communities where they didn't have access to those things. So basically, the way that they would organize is that they would speak on the street. Now, Elizabeth was already an experienced street speaker, if you think about it. But they had what were called free speech fights. This map here just shows where some of these free speech fights were because the employers in those communities were not wild about the fact that the IWW was there organizing. So they would get the city fathers to ban street speaking. And what the Wobblies would do is they would roll, they would get the message out through their various communications channels. And Wobblies, IWW members would come, you know, riding the rails and come into town and um, set up campaigns for free speech. And what they would do is they would get a soapbox and somebody would get up on it and start speaking, perhaps reading the Bill of Rights. And then a police officer would come and arrest him and take him off to jail. And somebody else would get up and start reciting the Bill of Rights until he got arrested. Pretty soon, the jails were full. And now the city's responsible for feeding all these people. <laughs> and after a while, they said, OK, well, you, we'll let you out. Um, one story that I like, I mean, she, and so she went out to the West, and she went to, she was there in Missoula, she was there in Spokane, she was there uh, in other cities where these free speech fights were going out. And if you want to read a great story about it, there's a fabulous novel called The Cold Millions by Jeff Walter. Ra raise your hand if you've read that. Um, great novel that is set during the free speech campaign in Spokane. So it's historical fiction, but she's there as a historical character in that. And it talks about her getting arrested, getting thrown into jail, uh, and sharing a cell with prostitutes uh, who, among other things, um, were basically taken out of the cell to brought down, brought downstairs to uh, meet with some of their, with their friends while they were in jail. And when she publicized that, it led to an end to that practice. Um, one of the stories I really like about the IWW singing tradition is that when they were out on the streets, they were barred from street speaking, but the Salvation Army was allowed to be out there with their band and singing. So um, the great songwriter Joe Hill, more about him in a few minutes, uh, wrote a song to one of the tunes that the Salvation Army Band played. So the song, a kin that some of you might know, called In the Sweet By and By. So Joe Hill turned that into pie in the sky when you die. <laughs> and it went something like this. So there's a few of you here who know it. So you can come in on the right point in the song, right? And it went, long-haired preachers come out every night, try to tell you what's wrong and what's right. But when asked about something to eat, they will answer in voices so sweet. You will eat. No, no, you're supposed to repeat it. It says call and response. So I say you will eat, and you say you will eat, all right? You will eat. You will eat. By and by, by and by, in that glorious land in the sky, in way up high, work and pray, work and pray. Live, on hay. live on hay, you'll get pie in the sky when you die. That's a lie. All right, very good. So. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a traveling speaker for the IWW. She was virtually, she wasn't the only woman. I mean, Mother Jones was around, but Elizabeth was, was really the main woman speaker. And she was, she was really, I mean, think about those here wouldn't be offended to say she was still just a kid. Um, anyway, but um, she 
went coast to coast, city to city, strike to strike, through these free speech fights, through rallies, and doing what was called labor defense, because people would get arrested, and people would get threatened, and people would get beat up, and sometimes people would get shot and killed in these struggles. And if she could, she would show up there and try to rally support for the workers and meet with them to help them figure out what they, what they needed to do. Is that Elizabeth in the, in the middle? Oh, sorry. Um, where were we here? Oops. No, uh, that is a that's but that's a photo from a free speech campaign in San Diego, and that is not her speaking. Thanks for bringing that up because I meant to meant to mention that. Um, one of the most famous strikes that she was involved with was just down the river in Lawrence, Massachusetts, in 1912. A strike that is known in history as the Bread and Roses strike. As in, we want bread, but we want roses too. We want to be able to enjoy the beautiful things in life and not just have to work all the time just to survive. What had happened was that the state of Massachusetts had reduced the work week, which was a good thing, from 56 hours to 54 hours, but the mill owners used that as an excuse and a reason to lower people's pay. So when the workers got their pay the next week, a group of Italian women walked out of the factory shouting, short pay. And they were soon followed by others. And pretty soon, pretty much the entire city and all the different mills were out on strike. Now, the IWW had been there in that city for years. And they organized across ethnic and linguistic lines. Um, but they were up against the police and armed militia, which included Harvard students who were recruited to be part of the militia. And they faced off in the streets with thousands of workers from dozens of nationalities. Two of the leaders for the IWW were Italian immigrants, Joe Etter and Arthur Giovanniti. And they were framed uh, after a woman named Anna Lopizzo, a striker, was shot and killed by a police officer. Etter and Giovanniti were two miles away at the time, but that didn't matter to the town fathers, to the local police, and all in that community. So the IWW brought Big Bill Haywood and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn into Lawrence basically to take over organizing the strike. And in that, again, so a lot of what she did was meeting with the workers, particularly with the women workers, to understand what they were going through, help organize rallies. Again, you've got dozens of nationalities and dozens of languages being spoken. And this is one of the things that the IWW did, which other unions uh, probably should have learned from you know, over the years about how to organize within a diverse workforce. For the IWW, it didn't matter where you were from. It didn't matter what language you spoke. What mattered was that you were a worker and that you needed to have power in the workplace and in the, in the larger society. One of the things that Elizabeth did was she organized something that was known as the Children's Crusade. On February 17, 1912, she arranged for 150 children of Lawrence to be put on a train. And she had all these connections in New York City. So she arranged for the children to get put on a train and sent down to New York. And that attracted a great deal of publicity to the strike and to the plight of these families which weren't able to feed their children because they were out on strike. And then they started to do it. They tried to do it again. And the second time, the police came out to the train station and started beating people up. Now, that made the news. And that was one of the things that started to um, didn't reflect well on the mill owners or on the city fathers of Lawrence. And that was one of the things that helped to put enough pressure on that the strike was settled with a raise for the workers. And it's interesting to think about because uh, if you think about the Birmingham children in 1963 and how what happened there when the children went out into the streets and how that got attention um, that we have you know some of these some of these different trends in history can happen. Flynn later said as reflection she said the IWW has been accused of putting women in the front the truth is rather that the IWW does not keep them to the back and they go to the front. I like that. 
She went to other strikes where she was in the leadership in Patterson, uh, where she was jailed to prevent her from speaking. She eventually won in court. Of course, that got written up in the New York Times. She went out to the Mesabi Range in Minnesota to work with iron ore workers. She was back and forth all the time. Um, one of the places where she stopped was Salt Lake City, where Joe Hill, the songwriter, was in prison. Joe Hill had been framed for murder that he didn't commit, the murder of a, of a grocery store owner and a, and a member of his family. Um, he wasn't around there. Um, probably he was with his girlfriend. But anyway, um, but Elizabeth showed up in Salt Lake City and visited him in jail and then became part of a way to try to get attention to his case. And what she had the knack for doing was figuring out what, she, what they called labor defense. But it was how do you tell the story of an individual who is being treated unjustly and use that to publicize the injustice and try to put pressure on whoever it is that needs to be pressured to bring about change so that that person can get let out of prison. She went so far in this case as to talk her way into the White House and talk to President Woodrow Wilson, who actually did write a letter to Governor Spry of Utah urging him to spare Joe Hill's life, but that was not to be. Uh, Joe Hill was executed by the state of Utah um, by a firing squad. Joan Baez wrote a, wrote a song about her. Well, she didn't write it, but she sang it. She'll so there's it. the song, I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, Joe Hill wrote a song called The Rebel Girl, which I'm not going to try to sing. <laughs> um, maybe later. Um, and he dedicated the song to her. And if, if, you, I don't, if, if we go back to that very first slide in this slideshow, was a picture of the IWW published sheet music. Uh, and you can see someone who's a, a cartoon version of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn carrying a red flag um, on the sheet music for this song. Practically, it, it's whether the last letter or second to last thing that Joe Hill ever wrote was a letter to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. The, the Wobblies called her Gurley, by the way. Um, that was how they referred to her. Um, and Joe Hill wrote, Friend Gurley, I have been saying goodbye so much now that it is becoming monotonous, but I just cannot help to send you a few more lines because you have been more to me than a fellow worker. You have been an inspiration, and when I composed The Rebel Girl, you was right there and helped me all the time. Be sure to locate a few more rebel girls like yourself because they are needed and needed badly. He tried to recommend to the IWW that they hire more women organizers like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn because the women who were, you know, most of, again, she was the only woman really in the leadership of the union. She had the ability to speak to women that the men did not. And Joe Hill, at least, was smart enough to recognize that that was something that was missing from the labor movement. Well, this was a period of time, think about it, of Repression of revolution and Red Scare. Massacres and mass arrests were common in the labor struggles during this period of time. In Everett, Washington in 1916, five IWW members were killed by local police on the ship Verona. In 1917, Frank Little, an IWW leader, was lynched in Butte, Montana and hung from a bridge. In 1917, striking copper miners in Bisbee, Arizona were kidnapped and put onto a train and shipped hours out into the desert and just let go because the Phelps Dodge Corporation didn't want them organizing in their minds. During World War I, 1,500 people, including Eugene Debs, were imprisoned for their opposition to the war, violations of the Espionage Act. In 1917 also, the Russian Revolution succeeded. And that put some additional strains into the system, we might say. The Department of Justice raided IWW offices in a number of cities in the country and took their membership files. And also during this period of time, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn um, had a spat with Big Bill Haywood, who was the president of the IWW. They were disagreeing over some uh, tactics to be used in the strike in the Mesabi range. And she just gradually parted ways with the union, um, which did not prevent her from getting arrested 
uh, along with 168 others um, in 1917. Again, she was the only woman of the 169 people who were arrested. They were charged with violating the Espionage Act, allegedly for opposing World War I. Um, really what it was was an excuse to crush the IWW, and in that I would say that they were largely successful. Even though the IWW, while most of its members were against the war and saw the war as a crime against the international working class, um, they were very careful to not make formal statements once the war began that would put them at odds with the federal government, which they knew was on the hunt for people who were speaking out against the war. Nevertheless, a bunch of them ended up in Leavenworth. Big Bill Haywood actually skipped bail and went to Moscow, where he uh, later died. Um, but anyway, Flynn left the IWW, and instead she formed her own organization called the Workers' Defense Union with a little office in New York City. And from there, in a sense, she was more of an organizer than an agitator. She circulated biographies of imprisoned workers. She got protest letters sent to high officials. She helped hire lawyers. She corresponded with the prisoners and their families and arranged for um, food or clothing or other things to be delivered to their families who were suffering. Um, she sent $5 to each prisoner at Christmas time. She fought deportations of immigrant radicals, including Emma Goldman. She publicized the impact of imprisonment on the children. And she raised money through giving speeches. And sometimes her speeches were spied upon by the newly formed Bureau of Investigation within the Federal Department of Justice. In 1919 and 1920 was when the so-called Palmer Raids took place all over the country, including here in New Hampshire. Um, workers, particularly workers from Eastern Europe, were rounded up and arrested. Um, accused of violating the Espionage Act or something or other. In New Hampshire, there were raids in Nashua, Manchester, Derry, Portsmouth, Berlin, Lincoln, Claremont, and Newmarket. And according to one history I've read, Nashua actually had more people arrested that day on January 2nd, 1920, than any other city in the United States. So the story of the Palmer Raids is a New Hampshire story, and you can read about it at nhradicalhistory.org. Um, in 1920, the American Civil Liberties Union formed uh, largely to defend conscientious objectors who were also being locked up in large numbers, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was one of the founding members. There was some discussion at this initial board or founding meeting about whether it was appropriate to have someone associated with the labor movement um, among their named founders because some of them were thinking that, well, we should be neutral in the struggle between the, uh, between the employers and the workers. And if we have somebody associated with the labor movement, that that could make us look biased or something. Anyway, that was defeated and she was accepted uh, as a as a founding member and later served on their board of directors. 1920 is also when Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested. Actually, she went to Boston to try to look in uh, at Deer Island, which was where the people from Manchester and Nashua and a bunch of other places were brought in Boston. And her, uh, her friend said, hey, while you're there, can you go down and check out the case of these people, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, who have been arrested down in Brockton? And the story of Sacco and Vanzetti, who were Italian anarchists, was well known in the Italian anarchist community, but it was not well known yet outside of that. So again, she put her skills together as a publicist, as an organizer, to be able to tell the story of these two men who were widely believed and still are widely believed to have been framed, um, and get that out. And this became a major cause celeb across the country during this period of time until they were executed by the state of Massachusetts. A few years later, the um, Workers' Defense Union merged with the group called the International Labor Defense. She became the president of that group, but things sort of went on from there. Um, I want to say a word about her personal life, because her personal life was a mess. Um, if you can imagine, she's traveling back and forth across the country. Um, she got married at age 18 to a wobbly organizer named Jack Jones. Um, her friend Vincent St. John said she fell in love with the West, and then she married the first Westerner she met, um, which might have been true. Um, her, their first child was stillborn. They had a second child uh, who was known as Buster, but uh, she split up with 
with Jones very quickly, uh, really by the time that Buster was born, they were no longer together. She was spending her life on the road. Buster was being cared for largely by her sister and her mom at their home in New York. Um, she wasn't a great parent. Um, she, from the point of the Lawrence strike, she met an Italian anarchist leader named Carlo Tresca, and he was the great love of her life, and they were together for years. He lived with them and their family in New York, they never married, um, but they lived together. She didn't believe that the state, you know, had any right to, in a sense, regulate, you know, what kind of love relationships people had, so she really wasn't into marriage anymore. Um, but after a while, she discovered that Carlo was having an affair with her sister, and that that had led to a child, Peter, being born. Um, and that did in that relationship in a hurry. Um, and she never really recovered from that. I mean, she had a number, a lot of other romantic involvements over, over her years, but she never found anybody else that she had that. Um, the love, the passion, the intellectual relationship that she did that she did with Carlo Tresca. And she's just exhausted from all of this work. If you can imagine, from the time she's 17 years old, she's got you know, not, not much of a break. So 1926, after a failed strike in Passaic, New Jersey, where she just threw it all in, she had a breakdown. Uh, she, went out, she went out to California to try to raise money for the Passaic strikers, and while she was there, she just collapsed. She went up to Portland, Oregon, where she um, was cared for by a radical woman doctor named Dr. Marie Equi. Now, Dr. Equi herself was connected with the IWW. She was against the. She served time in jail for being against the war. She uh, performed illegal abortions. Um, she was an advocate of, of contraception. Um, she was a perhaps more radical than Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was. Uh, so Elizabeth moved in with her. Whether they were romantically involved is not clear. Some people think maybe, most people think probably not, but there's no evidence of it either way. But they were together there for about 10 years uh, as Dr. Equi helped Elizabeth uh, recover her health. And Elizabeth then also cared for Dr. Equi during her period of difficulty and for uh, Dr. Equi's adopted daughter during a period of time. Um, and during this period of time, she was able to read a lot. And eventually, it was time for her to come back. Now, things had changed during this period of time. The IWW, which really had been her family and these other people, no longer existed. Um, and she decided at this time that it was time to join the Communist Party. She had been you know, involved with, you know, she had been in communication with them for some time. But it's not until 1936. So think about it now, she's 46 years old. This is when she becomes officially a member of the Communist Party. Um, and she, which she sees this as a socialist political party rooted in the working class. And that's where she is most comfortable. The Great Depression was on, arousing a little bit of skepticism about capitalism. Workers were mobilizing. The Communist Party was supporting unions. They were supporting the CIO. They were interracial. They believed in civil rights. And they saw, they saw fascism as a serious threat um, as fascism was rising in Europe. And this was a place where Elizabeth felt comfortable and found a new family. This was the years of the Popular Front where the Communist Party was really a close ally of FDR and the New Deal. And the Communist Party put aside its own electoral ambition, stopped running candidates, and basically organized to support FDR and the New Deal during this period of time. And again, uh, the, the fight against fascism or resistance to fascism was extremely important during this period of time. Now, it's also important to recognize that during this period of time, the leadership of the Communist Party was also taking orders from Moscow. Um, so this is also part of it. And in terms of their foreign policy and other elements of the way that they were organized and what they focused on, certainly the Communist Party leadership in Moscow had a lot to say over what was going on. But Flynn joined. And due to her experience and notoriety, she was elevated to national leadership. Again, she was the only woman on the National Executive Committee. Her focus was on labor struggles and civil rights. She was a popular speaker and writer. She wrote, think about this, Adolf, she wrote three to four columns a week 
for the communist press. Um, she gave four to five speaking tours a, a year where she'd go on the road for you know, a couple months at a time, sometimes visiting 10 different states, giving five speeches a week, plus radio addresses. She developed relationships with local communist leaders and members across the country, something that the top leaders who were ensconced in New York and Chicago and LA never really had. She focused on anti-fascism and on issues confronting the working class. She followed the party line during the years, the two years of the Hitler-Stalin pact. Um, and when that broke down and the US and USSR became allies, she and the rest of the CP, Communist Party, became staunch pro-war patriots, even discouraging strikes during the duration of the war. She was still a popular speaker during this period of time, particularly addressing women's conferences. She addressed 25 women's conferences in 1945. She stressed the importance of women's labor in the war industries and demanded that they have access to childcare. She was also booted off the board of the ACLU, believers of free speech and freedom of association, because she was a communist. Um, they later expressed their regrets. Anyway, after the war, she continued to stress the importance of women's labor, even when men in the party leadership disagreed. And she continued touring the country, including trips to New Hampshire. Um, Louis Wyman, anybody know Louis Wyman? Oh, yeah. All right. Louis, um, Louis did his own investigation into subversive activities in New Hampshire because um, the state had a law barring subversive activities, so he decided he wanted to investigate and find out where they were. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she's mentioned a couple times here because she apparently came to New Hampshire uh, during that period of time uh, and spoke at least to a Communist Party group in, Ware, in Manchester and to another group in Ware, according to Louis. He was probably correct as far as that was concerned. But I noticed in one of these books, in a footnote, um, it's talking about her differences, basically that she was very comfortable with this popular front concept and sort of that the Communist Party really as being a working class political party. Um, and she wasn't into Marxist theory so much. She was really into what workers were experiencing. Um, William Z. Foster, who became the head of the Communist Party during this post-war period, was much more into drilling people in Marxist theory and much more attached to the words that were coming down from Moscow. But there's one little, there's a point in this Lara Vopnik biography where it contrasts what Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was saying and thinking during this period with what Foster was thinking. And I was just sort of curious about it. And I looked at the footnote. And the footnote refers to a radio speech given on WKXL in Concord, New Hampshire on April 12th, 1947. <laughs> so I'm now really curious about that. And I'm in touch with the uh, special collections librarian at NYU in New York, where most of her papers are. And in like box four, folder 31 or something like that, um, is a microfilm uh, that includes this, whatever this was, from WKXL in Concord. So I'm hopeful that one of these days they will get that out on the microfilm and find a way to print it or scan it and, and send it to me, because I really want to know what she said when she was in her birth city of Concord. Um, her period of time uh, sort of leading up to sort of before the war in her, really before she uh, decamped to Oregon, she later referred to as her first life when she wrote her memoirs. She always wanted to write about her second life, which would have been her, her Communist Party years, but she never got around to it. Um, the Cold War began immediately after the war ended. Um, Truman tried to blend anti-communist foreign policy with the New Deal, but he kept getting pushed to the right by the Republicans. Intolerance for dissent reached a new low. Um, some of you may have seen a documentary called Rights and Reds, New Hampshire During the Cold War, produced by John Graffair. Watch it. Watch it again. We were not spared uh, this. It's about Louis Wyman and uh, what he was up to during this period. But 1947 was the year that Truman imposed loyalty oaths. The 
Uh, House on American Activities Committee had the Hollywood 10 hearings. Joe McCarthy was sworn in as a US Senator. And the next year, 12 Communist Party leaders were indicted under the Smith Act. William Foster was later not tried because of ill health. Um, they basically went for all of the men on the National Executive Committee, and for reasons not exactly clear, they did not indict Elizabeth Gurley Flynn at that time. The Smith Act, formerly known as the Alien Registration Act, passed in 1940. The Communist Party was not its target at the time, and in fact, the Communists cheered when the Feds went after the Trotskyists. Um, but eventually, it caught up with them. And the Smith Act made it illegal to advocate the overthrow of the government by force or violence. Now, the 11 communists were not accused of organizing to overthrow the government by force or violence. They were not accused of advocating the overthrow of the government by force or violence. They were accused of conspiring to advocate the overthrow of the government by force and violence. And if there's any lawyers here, uh, perhaps you can explain uh, the ins and outs of conspiracy theory to me, because I've been reading this stuff over and over again, and it still is a bit of a mystery to me. But basically, the government introduced evidence of all these Marxist-Leninist tracts that um, were passed out at communist meetings, and people were encouraged to read, and said, see, this is what they believe. And then when they said, well, actually, if you look at our Constitution, it says that we believe in achieving socialism through democratic means and elections. Um, and then the witnesses who were um, infiltrators um, and ex-communists would say, no, but when they say that, they don't mean that. <laughs> and, and the jury went along with that. And these 11 were, were convicted. And as soon after this case went up to the Supreme Court in what's usually referred to as the Dennis case, after Eugene Dennis, who was the general secretary of the party at that time, um, right after that, they went after um, hundreds of other communists, including knocking on the door in Elizabeth's apartment in New York and taking her away. So then she went on, tri she went on trial, a trial that lasted for 10 months. They couldn't, the lawyers from the first case, actually most of them got locked up for contempt. Uh, it was pretty difficult for these folks to find lawyers. So Elizabeth ended up serving as her own lawyer during this lengthy trial and spent um, a lot of time on the witness stand. She was on the witness stand from October 3rd until December 2nd. And I want to um, read just a little bit. How are we doing on time here, Jim? Oh, 10 more minutes. Okay, yeah, well that, that, I can do that. Um, this is part of what she said on the stand. She said, we will prove to you that we are not a criminal conspiracy, but a 33-year-old working class political party devoted to the immediate needs and aspirations of the American people, to the advancement of workers, farmers, and the Negro people, to the preservation of the democracy and culture, and to the advocacy of socialism. My youthful ambition, believe it or not, was to be a constitutional lawyer. Instead, I became a labor organizer. Then it was called an agitator, or by the press, one who stirred up the people. I was determined to do something about the bad conditions under which our family and all around us suffered. I have stuck to that purpose for 46 years. I consider in so doing I have been a good American. I've spent my life among the American workers all over the country, slept in their homes, eaten at their tables. They are the majority of the people who have the inalienable right, in our view, to govern the country. Our country is a rich and beautiful country, fully capable of producing plenty for all, educating its youth, and caring for its aged. We believe it could do this under socialism. We will prove to you that it is not we who flaunt the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but that has always been done by the employing class. We will prove that we are fighting here for our constitutional and democratic rights, not to advocate force and violence, but to expose and stop its use against the people. We will demonstrate that in fighting for our rights, we believe we are defending the constitutional rights of all Americans. We believe we are acting as good Americans. Um, that didn't fly. Again, think about the period of time you know, this is before any of us were born, of course, but, um, but the anti-communism was extremely intense during this period of time, and frankly, you know, the Soviet Union wasn't exactly doing things that 
you know, were winning them many fans in this country during that period of time also. Uh, anyway, Elizabeth and the others were found guilty. The Supreme Court refused to hear their appeal, and she was sent off to the Federal Penitentiary for Women in Alderson, Virginia. She was there for 28 months, from January 55 to May of 57. She had limited access to the news and to communication, but she did have, get some letters that she was able to receive and some that she was able to send out. So if you think about the time while she was in prison, in 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, and the modern civil rights movement, in effect, was born. In 1956, Nikita Khrushchev gave a secret speech in which the Communist Party and the Soviet Union started to fess up for the first time about the terrible crimes committed by Stalin and during that period of time, although the Soviet Union also invaded Hungary, setting off more turmoil both in the outer world, but all of these things created great turmoil within the Communist Party and led to, for however many members it had, sort of during its heyday, um, during the Popular Front period, uh, its membership kept declining, 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 declining during this period of time. So when she comes out of prison and goes back into the Communist Party leadership, the Communist Party was a shell of its former self. Uh, she was the chairperson. I still don't quite understand the difference between the chair and the general secretary, because Gus Hall was the general secretary. But certainly, she was in the leadership during that period of time. Um, she published a book on her years at Alderson. She still wanted to write a memoir of her second life. Um, she was hoping to work on it. She went to Moscow in 1964 for a vacation. When she was in Moscow, where she visited a number of times, she was treated as a VIP which she was not treated that way in her own country, uh, where she lived a pretty struggling you know, life. Um, I don't know that she was, you know, in later years, she, she, I don't know that she was as desperately poor as her family had been when she was growing up, but she was not a well-off woman. But when she was in Moscow, she was treated, you know, she was put up in good hotels and given all these great meals and fed at parties and stuff. Uh, anyway, she was hoping to write uh, the next part of her memoirs during that period of time, or at least to work on it. But she got sick, and she died very quickly. Um, there was, in fact, a uh, big uh, state-sponsored funeral uh, in Moscow. Um, and then her remains were sent back to the United States, and sh they were buried in Chicago. Her obituary was on the front page of the New York Times. So. Um, just again, in terms of to kind of sandwich the story of somebody of, of historical significance. And on her grave marker in Chicago, it says 1890 to 1964, the rebel girl, fighter for working class emancipation. This brings our story up to the present. Um, as I was starting to work on this New Hampshire Radical History Project, I remembered that 15 years earlier I had had this conversation with Eva Sartwell and Mary Lee Sargent about maybe we could get a historical marker for Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Eva, I don't know if, how many of you remember Eva, um, a force of nature. She went off and just started doing the research, figured out where the family had lived, and discovered that it was on Montgomery Street. I think there was actually an article in the Concord Monitor about it. Um, but she didn't go through with the process that was necessary to actually get the state to put up a historical marker. And I was busy doing other stuff and always had this idea, like, someday I'll work on this. Uh, and it wasn't until after I retired and I was working on this history project, I went, oh, look at this. And by now, there's a World Wide Web. You can actually the state pol policy and like how you get a historical marker, like what qualifies, you know, a person of historical significance, you know, in history, uh, provide us with the wording of what the marker should say, where it should be, give us you know, 20 people or more who think that this should happen and give us a lot of footnotes for all the facts that would be on this marker. So Mary Lee and I went through this process and just sat back and waited. And then months and months and months went by and I really had no expectations and then we get an email an email? Anyway, then I get a <laughs> then I get a message saying, oh yeah, we're working on this. Um, we want to, you know, tinker with the wording a little bit. So we did a little bit of tinkering on the wording. They had a suggestion. You know, One of them was good. One of them wasn't as good. And then they said, OK, we're going to go ahead and order the marker. And then they ordered the marker. Um, and then I heard, well, 
there's a problem because of COVID and the supply chain. The company that produces the markers is way behind. So uh, we don't know when it's going to arrive. And then it's like, oh, now the marker has arrived. Where should we put it? And we had said in our initial application that we thought that somewhere around Montgomery Street, the corner of Montgomery and State, the corner of Montgomery and Court, um, would be good places because that was where her family lived. And they said, OK, well, let's, let's go with Court and Montgomery. Um, which at the time they thought was actually city property. So we had to go to city council and the city heritage commission, which both approved the location of this state historic marker. Uh, we installed it on May 1. A few of people here present were there. Carolyn led us in song. Um, and then a little bit of controversy erupted. And two weeks later, the marker was gone. So um, at this point, um, we can talk about that. But um, I know that um, Jim doesn't want this to be, this is supposed to be about history here, not about politics. So we won't uh, get into too much of this. But I just want to read, finish up by saying, read from the letter that we sent to the Division of Historical Resources with our petitions on July 8th, 2021. It said, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is a well-known historic figure who contributed greatly to struggles for workers' rights, women's equality, and civil liberties, generating considerable controversy along the way. Her life and historic significance are well documented by her biographers in her own memoirs and with references in many books about the period in which she lived. She even has a major role in a recent historical novel. But less known is that she was born in Concord, not far from the State House. A marker at or near her birthplace in Concord would give appropriate recognition to the place where this remarkable life began. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can read. To, you want to learn more about her. I brought my Elizabeth Gurley Flynn Library with me today. Um, we can talk more about that. If you want to know more about um, this story and a bunch of others, uh, check out nhradicalhistory.org uh, at your leisure and uh, get in touch with me through that. Uh, and I want to mention that Lara Vopnik, who is an Elizabeth Gurley Flynn biographer, has been invited by the New Hampshire Humanities Council to give a webinar, which is going to be on Zoom at 5 PM a week from tomorrow. So I brought with me some flyers about that, which you can grab. And uh, Elizabeth would be 133 on August 7th. So on the Saturday before that, which is August 5, we're going to have an Elizabeth Gurley Flynn soapbox speak out, where we're going to put a soapbox out at City Plaza uh, and encourage folks to get up and say what's on their mind, particularly um, some of the many people who have written things about the Elizabeth Gurley Flynn marker. Thank you very much. We have a question from the I press. I've got a question here. And um, yeah, okay. uh, more of a, a, a clarification. Yeah. There is considerable uh, disagreement among uh, labor historians that, that Joe Hill actually was uh, framed for the murder, that he may have been guilty. Second, a little detail on, uh, on uh, strike in, uh, in uh, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Most most of historians claim that the majority of the uh, women strikers were Polish. However, further investigation shows that about 40% of the women were actually Lithuanian. Interesting. Uh, and uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, many Americans don't really know the difference between right. uh, Polish and Lithuanian. Right. Uh, there are some who don't just know the difference between Baltic history books and uh, that other C over there. Baltic. Right. You might ask, how do I know this? <laughs> well, I would not ask that. Because, because I am in my 59th year as a labor goon, and uh, I am an immigrant from Lithuania. Right. So, um, oh, well, one other thing. I know that somebody here was wearing a St. Louis, yeah. oh, there is, St. Louis hat, and I just returned uh, uh, from a labor convention in St. Louis, and I noticed that there was a lot of public 
mention of Lindbergh in mm -hmm. St. Louis, the pal of Hitler, and it made me think that there's a certain relationship here between our marker and what's going on. What gets, and yeah, what gets recognized as being of historical significance. Anyway, Adolf, um, I'd encourage you to read this book. The Man Who Never Died, The Lifetimes and Legacy of Joe Hill, American Labor Icon. Um, yeah, this basically, I thought, made a convincing case for the fact that Joe Hill was framed. Um, perhaps others disagree. Um, as for the people from the countries of what we think of as Eastern Europe, uh, an interesting thing that I found in my research on the period of the Palmer Raids was that um, all those folks were just called Russians. <laughs> or around here. Well, they were, they were Russians, they were Poles, they were Lithuanians, and the raid that happened in Nashville where 168 people were arrested was actually in the Lithuanian hall on Chestnut Street. So whether the people who were in the hall at that time were actually Lithuanians or whether they were Russians or Poles or some combination of which I have not been able to find out. What well, the epithets of, uh, uh, against the Lithuanians that we were called punkies when I came to this country? Because they confuse us with Hungarians. Hungarians. We have another question from the press back there. Okay. I'm not the press. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, just notice the, the retired reporters are the first ones with their hands up. Uh, so the one thing is that uh, I just wanted to mention, I'm reading a biography of Jay Hoover called uh, E-Man. And they mentioned that Elizabeth Carley Flynn was the most important labor leader during the time of the Palmer Raids, besides Emma Goldman, who was deported. Uh, and Hoover was participated in right. was a very key figure in the Palmer Raids. Yep. Uh, and then I just wanted to, I just had a question. What, what was the differences between um, Hayward and, and Flynn in terms of the, uh, you know, what, what, what was the, the cause of that split? I, I would have to go back and reread the chapters in these books, Bob. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with, with you know, just different elements of, of strategy and such. Later on, at the time of the trial, um, Flynn, when they were all indicted under the Espionage Act, Flynn was saying we should, be, we should separate all these cases, demand separate trials, and base our defense on our rights under the Constitution. And Haywood was at that time advocating, no, we should use the courtroom to stand up for what we believe in as wobblies. And uh, she actually got her case severed from theirs because she wasn't even in the IWW anymore at that point. And she, there was no evidence, well, not that the others had evidence that they were anti-war, but she was able to get her case separated. And then um, the others all got found guilty. So anyway. One more question. Yeah. Um, you'll, stand, you'll stick around, right? Oh, I'll stick around. I yes. was surprised that uh, women won the battle uh, to vote in 1920, but she did not vote until the mid-1930s. I think 1937, mm -hmm. I read somewhere. Just about the same time, she joined the Communist Party, which I found really interesting. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, it's a good, that's a great question. I mean, I think that the way to understand it is that she believed in, she was a strong believer from childhood in women's equality. She believed that women should have the right to vote. But her work with the IWW was focused on workers. And her, she believed in, the, that was where people's power came from, was their power as workers. And the IWW, which was a movement largely of people who couldn't vote anyway, didn't focus on that type of politics. So um, it wasn't what she was thinking about. I don't know why she didn't vote you know, in, the, in the 20s or into the 30s. Later on, she did vote, and she strongly supported voting. And she, in fact, ran for office a couple times. So it's a, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, all right, one last one. <laughs> OK, uh, my, my question for you, I guess, is why the word infamous appears on the market. That seems to be the difference to me between history and advocacy. Ah. Because, like you wouldn't say, the infamous Adolf Hitler. There's a the reference. Stuff, well, she's so. not referred to as the only adjective that's in here is the, uh, the Smith Act is referred to as uh, notorious, I think. Or, or what is it here? <laughs> the, the notorious <laughs> Smith Act. Okay, but, so know, so I think that the, the thing about the Smith Act was that while the first 11 communists were convicted under it, and Flynn and a bunch of others were convicted under it. Pretty quickly after that, this US Supreme Court 
put a stop to it and said that really um, we should not be putting people in prison because of their political beliefs. And that is, in fact, what was, what was going on, or based on speech, based on association. And uh, while the Smith Act itself was never found unconstitutional, the enforcement of it as it had been enforced was, was put to a stop. And at this point, I'd say it's basically considered an embarrassment. Okay, but the Dred Scott decision was, you know, an embarrassment. The uh, yeah. Adolf Hitler was, you know, not a nice figure. But right. you would not call them notorious or well, infamous on a market. Interesting thing, and um, in fact, uh, I would have, I, to be honest, I would have expected the people at the Division of Historical Resources to uh, raise questions about that one, and they did not. It was fine with them, I guess. So. Anyway, as we talked about a couple of just, differences, can yeah. Can Arnie read the marker? Because the, the word notorious refers to the Smith Act, not right. Elizabeth Gurley. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I'm going to welcome you all to come and visit with Arnie, but we've got to call them to a close yeah. and meet. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you.